so much. I hope I don't get tangled up in these wires. Good, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, um, Patricia, and for inviting me to be here. Um, I was excited to be at the Ronald Reagan uh, lecture series. Uh, my father, who just recently passed away, Ronald Reagan, was his hero. So he would be, have been very impressed that I was here talking at anything entitled by Ronald Reagan. Um, he liked both his movie and his political career. Uh, in any case, um, I'm always excited to talk about privacy. Um, I think that it's, it's a subject that I am absolutely passionate about. I've been studying it for a number of years. And what I'd like to do uh, this evening is to first walk you through sort of a historical look at uh, how the concept of privacy has evolved in the United States over the years. Um, then I want to talk about what's ha happening in the healthcare domain, what's happening in the healthcare community, and some of the issues that are now being hotly debated. And while I don't have all the answers to these questions, they're going to have to be debated over a long period of time, I think it's important for people to be aware of what these debates are all about. And then third, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what you can do to protect your privacy, the privacy of your medical information, because it's really important that, that we be aware of what we need to do in order to keep our information private. And then, as Patricia said, uh, we can talk uh, you know, ample time for, for questions, and I'm happy to talk about questions outside the healthcare domain if you'd rather talk about other areas because I have worked in them as well. Can you move that forward, please? Thank you. I'm going to start, and don't panic, I'm going to start in 1890. I am leaving out a couple hundred years of English law, but that's okay. I'll start in 1890. Um, at that time, uh, uh, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis published in the Harvard Law Review an article that was called The Right to Privacy. And at the time, uh, they saw an emerging new right in the common law, and they thought it was the right to privacy or the right to be left alone. Now you can see when you read this extract, this quote from the article, you can see that they had um, so much discomfort with the yellow press at the time. Journalism was, was really turning negative at the time and they were very dissatisfied with it. Also, um, some scholars have, have read that Samuel Warren was apparently married to a uh, senator's daughter. And this daughter, um, this, his wife, was very friendly with Grover Cleveland's wife, when Grover Cleveland was the president at the time. And apparently there was um, a fair amount of press coverage of you know, various activities involving her, including coverage of the deaths of several of her family members within just like a two-week period. And it's been said that this article might not have been written had he not had that experience, because that affected him greatly. Um, the, in the article, um, Warren and Brandeis talk about how the common law has evolved to meet the changing needs of society over time and how it evolved from uh, protecting people from intangible threats to, yeah, I mean, from tangible threats to actually protecting them from intangible threats as well. Um, and so, uh, so they saw this as uh, something that was coming out of the co common law. They, they didn't think that um, privacy was absolute, however. They thought privacy was an important right. They thought that people should have privacy in their persons, in their images, in what was written about them in the press. But they also realized that there were boundaries to, to this new right. And part of those boundaries were that if you disclosed something to the public already, it was in the public view. And it wasn't, you couldn't claim privacy over that anymore. Also, in terms of things of general or public interest, those kinds of things would not be subject to privacy as well. It was, um, it was very interesting that at the time the uh, Law Review uh, article was published, it had very little effect. It was, you know, it was um, not much happened. But over time, what happened is, is that the state and the federal courts um, began to recognize privacy as a principle in, in the law. And they began to expand this right um, more than formerly. Uh, and this article is actually now credited as starting the, the field of privacy law, really. And it is also um, one of the you know, most cited law review articles of all time and thought to be one of the most influential pieces of um, review articles ever published. So, next one. 
you'll be relieved to know I'm going all the way from 1890 to 1968. This is, um, uh, I'm talking here about the publication of Alan Weston's book, Privacy and Freedom, which was published in 1968. And to me, this is a very important work. Um, it unfortunately isn't available in electronic form. It's a huge tome, a really big book. It's out of print. I got it, uh, my copy, I got it through a, you know, a used online bookstore. Um, but the book is remarkable in reflecting in 1968 many of the problems that we are seeing today. It is just thoroughly, it is thoroughly amazing. And what Weston's book really talked about is the conflict at the time between privacy and surveillance in the society that followed World War II. And he described a growing trend of technological innovations that enabled this increase. And he, he was very concerned about technology also, about radio signal transmitters that were very small and that could be hidden, about binoculars that were very powerful, eavesdropping devices, little microphones, um, telephoto lenses. Um, and he was also concerned about what he called psychological surveillance, which included things like polygraphs and, and um, personality tests. And he said at the time, and I think this is remarkably like the world we live in today, that the, the increase in surveillance was really due to two factors. And one was the increased availability of electronic devices at a low cost. And the other was that the increased willingness of individuals to divulge information about themselves and curiosity about public figures and very much like the world we live in today. Um, I, uh, Dr. Weston um, passed away uh, a number of years ago. I don't know, I never got a chance to ask him about what he thought about reality t um, television, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't anything positive. <laughs> the, um, the thing that he was, he was very concerned about was what he called data surveillance because he, was, he felt that people would be leaving sort of a documentary footprint behind them all the time and all this information would be pulled into computers and these would be, um, the, he was very worried about the power of government and felt that this would give government a really unprecedented amount, unprecedented amount of power because of all this information. Um, and he predicted in the future, and I think he was not wrong, that the future would raise even, even future, um, even broader privacy concerns. Um, I think something that's interesting about what, what Weston talked about is that he said that uh, these surveillance technologies didn't grow out of a desire to do surveillance. They grew out of a desire to solve some of the big problems of the time, like space travel and medical research and communications. That's where they came from. But they said it was only after the technologies were deployed and information could that be, be gathered. Um, and sometimes this was at a significant cost that you know, only the government could do something like this because it was so costly to develop these technologies. Um, then, only at that point did um, the government and private entities start to use them for surveillance. And so he thought that these unanticipated uses of technology as well as novel uses of personal information um, was really creating a, um, a complex landscape of privacy issues. Um, clearly at the time, Weston thought things were out of whack in 68. And he said, it is time to return to um, a balance of privacy in America. And it is interesting that he, um, he, he thought that surveillance in particular should be very, very limited and only in cases of national security and in major crimes. Uh, it was interesting, too, that he did not advocate necessarily regulation. He advocated that private organizations could um, you know, voluntarily comply with principles in order to protect people's privacy. So he, he wasn't particularly um, in, in favor of any um, you know, large regulatory programs to take care of this. Um, next one, please. Um, the, around, um, you know, sometime later, the, um, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, it was Elliot Richardson at the time, uh, commissioned uh, an advisory committee to look at the um, extent to which that limitations should be placed on the application of computer technology to keep records on the American public. 
And um, you know, this was around the time when we were talking basically mainframe computers. I mean, it wasn't it, it wasn't the kind of personal computing that we know today. Um, and the the Commission on Privacy came up. They did a very, very thorough study. It is very many volumes of information that they collected. And they came up with a set of five principles that they sh thought should govern and protect the use of personal information. And they called these the fair information practices. And we in the privacy profession, of course, call those the FIPS because we need an acronym too. And, um, and these, these practices were really aimed at um, at addressing what they thought was a, a really poor level of protection afforded to personal information under existing law. Uh, the, the five principles that they originally came up with, it was actually, um, it, it underlies the, um, the Privacy Act of 1974, which was passed shortly thereafter. The Privacy Act uh, was the first um, first piece of legislation to place limits on the, on the government's collection, use, and dissemination of information. Um, and it was largely uh, you know, passed in the wake of the Watergate scandal where there was a lot of um, concern about the misuse of personal information. Um, the, a revised vision of the FIPS um, later on was uh, done by the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development in 1980. And these are the eight principles that, that I've displayed up there. These are um, really the bedrock principles of privacy. Um, they've been re-endorsed by the OECD a number of times, including in 1998 and 2006. They have really um, stood the test of time in terms of establishing bedrock principles. Um, and they are, with, you know, with some variation, of course, they underlie most of the laws in many, many countries across the United States. And you know, not only the Privacy Act, but HIPAA, and we'll talk about that a little bit, these underlie the, the um, HIPAA as well. And um, so I think um, I'd just like to touch on each of these uh, a little bit uh, to let you know what they are. And they're actually very, you know, quite simple and, and straightforward. Uh, if we talk about, uh, first of all, purpose specification, what that means is that when an entity collects information, they should specify the purpose for which they're collecting that information. And the information should only be used for that purpose. A very important uh, uh, privacy um, principle. Uh, collection limitation means that you should only collect information for the purpose um, that you need. You should not collect extraneous information, only the information that's required for your purpose. Data quality means that the information should be as accurate as it can for the purpose that you have in mind. And you can see that everything's anchored to that purpose. I mean, it's very, privacy is very context specific. So, um, you know, uh, the degree of accuracy for one purpose might be different than the degree of accuracy needed, needed for another purpose. Um, Security safeguards, of course, that the information has to be, you know, have reasonable safeguards to prevent it from unauthorized loss and, and disclosure. Uh, we have a couple that deal with, um, with then the public or the people whose information is collected, and that is openness. And an entity should be open about what their privacy principles, what their privacy practices are, and they should make them available to the public. Um, it's a good principle, but it's also led to you know, all those privacy notices that everybody just sort of scrolls through and says, I agree, right? Because they've gotten way, way large and way out of hand and not terribly uh, user-friendly at this point. Um, but it does have its roots here. Individual participation, meaning that people should have a right to know what kind of information an entity has collected about them. They should have a right to, um, they should have a right to contest the accuracy of that information if they believe it's inaccurate, and they should have the ability to contest their rights if they think they're being violated. So these eight principles together, like I said, they underlie much, much of the legal framework that um, we see in privacy, not only in the United States, but across the world. Next. And in fact, the fair information um, principles have been adopted by many, many organizations, um, including many government agencies. These, because I'm talking about, um, about pr uh, health information privacy, these are the fair information practice principles, and that's what usually um, they come to be called as um, FIPS with two Ps. And um, these are the ones that HHS adopted for uh, 
as the principles for the exchange of health information across networks for the sharing of individually identifiable information. So um, you can see that these are a little bit different than, than the ones I just talked about. And there are, there are actually many, many versions of, of the FIPS, including DHS has one, um, DARPA has one, the IRS has one, and they closely, uh, they try to tailor these a little bit to, um, to fit their particular situations. And this, you'll have to permit me, this is one of my pet peeves as a privacy person. Privacy is not the same as security. And we as privacy professionals sometimes get irritated because people are talking about security and privacy and what they really mean is security. And security really has to do with confidentiality, integrity, availability of information. But you've seen the FIPS now, and so you realize that security is just one factor in protecting people's privacy. The other factors are, are just as equal, they're just as essential, and they all have to be observed. So it's like a, sort of a holistic approach is needed in order to assure someone's privacy. So now that I've got that off my chest. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, push it again. I always wanted to use one of those. Um, <laughs> So privacy, it's not absolute. It's not absolute at all. It's not an absolute right. It has boundaries. It, is, um, it has parameters. And it's very context specific. And what you might decide in one context with one type of information and one kind of purpose might be very different than other situations. That one makes me dizzy. Um, the, um, but what it is about is about balance in the end. In the end, it's about balancing individual privacy with other societal needs, wants, desires. And those other, those other um, uh, desires could be something like national security. It can be something like convenience for the consumer. It can be any number of things that we are balancing with privacy. Um, a number of years ago, when we first started after 9-11, you know, really the debate about security, and the 9-11 Commission came you know, out with their report, and they said, you know, be careful. Um, you know, it's, it's a false choice to choose you know, security over your rights. And because they were very concerned, too, at the time that the pendulum could swing too far. Um, so this is a matter about, of balance. But there, there was a time when people were saying, oh, you can have as much national security as you want, and you can have as much privacy as you want. It, doesn't, it, it, it just doesn't work out that way. And I think all of us know that when we you know, go through the whole body scanner at the airport, that we have, a, you know, regardless of whether we agree with that program or not, we know that we have given up a degree of our privacy in order to meet this, this balancing societal uh, desire. Okay. Um, since I'm going to be talking about um, health information, I wanted to talk a little bit about the environment right now in health information. Uh, the, uh, definitely the way things are going, we are moving to a digital world in, in health information, to electronic health records. And we're also, the government has, um, you know, HHS has a very deliberate strategy and program to try to facilitate the movement of um, these records from uh, paper to electronic and also to an environment where this information can be widely shared with your providers. So this is, this is the direction that things are going in. Now, why it's so exciting to work in the area of health privacy is that obviously we're talking about new technologies, we're talking about new players, we're talking about new ways of business, and it's creating, you know, it's raising new kinds of privacy concerns that clearly have not yet been figured out but need to be addressed in order for this to work. And I think everybody knows as this, um, you know, as we build the nationwide health information network that if um, if the public is not assured that they feel that their information is going to be safe, it's going to be private, it's going to be secure, they may not wish to participate in this and they may, may decide to opt out in any number of ways that they can decide how to. 
So, um, so one of the things that, I mean, at, uh, it was just a few years ago, really, at the, um, the Office of the National Coordinator, which is the HHS office that is charged with trying to facilitate this transformation. They, they now have a chief privacy officer. They have lots of advisory groups. They try, do try to hear from the public on um, what the concerns are and try to monitor what the public's um, views. They've been doing surveys for a couple years that I've been involved with. Um, to find out um, what, where, what people temperature on, on privacy and security at this time and try to be able to, to react to that as they roll out their policies. So it's a very, uh, a very exciting environment and, um, and, and very different. Okay, next one. But at the, and at the same time, this is also true, that people are starting to understand that the value of medical data is really high, you know, for people who want to do us harm, and um, you know, this is this is one one figure I pulled off the internet. Um, I went to a big um, health information technology uh, conference last week in in Orlando, and I think there this was from 2011. I think the number is slightly lower now, to be to be fair. Um, but the fact is, is that it's a, it's a lot more valuable than uh, your financial data, and that's something that most people might not have might not have guessed. Okay. Before we get into, um, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the, the issues that we're seeing in health information privacy. But first, I want to talk about, um, about HIPAA just a little bit. And I'm going to give you the nickel tour of HIPAA. It's a long, long thing, um, but um, I'm going to give you the capsule uh, overview of what it is. HIPAA is, is quite misunderstood. There are a lot of myths surrounding, surrounding HIPAA, and I see in practice how many times I'm told, oh, we can't do that because of HIPAA, and frankly, it's, re it, it's really the case that, that, that that's true. Um, but people misunderstand its, its intent, I think, and um, how it operates. Uh, it was uh, passed in 1996, and it was updated by the High Tech Act in 2009. Um, most of the details that really govern um, privacy and security in HIPAA are really in two regulations that HHS um, maintains, and those are the privacy rule and the security rule. And in addition to that, they now have a breach notification rule that was brought on by high tech because now, you know, everybody now realizes what the danger is in breaches and that, that uh, entities need to have a responsibility to let people know if their information is breached and help mitigate the damage that can result from that. Um, so they have that as well as an enforcement role. One of the big criticisms of HIPAA over the years has been the lack of HHS enforcement. For many years, HHS did not, in, did no enforcement actions against, um, you know, entities that are covered under HIPAA. And I think there was perhaps some, they were giving time to let people start to implement the, and the law. But during the last couple years, it has been much more, um, much more active. There have been many cases. There's not, um, there's not a private right of action under HIPAA. You can't sue anybody. Uh, but the government can take uh, compliance. The Office of uh, Civil Rights in HHS can take um, civil actions against um, uh, entities that violate the, um, the regulations or the law. So, and if you look at the HHS website, be able to see some of those cases, as well as they have to post all their breach, all the breaches that have happened in the community that affect more than 500 people. And it's very interesting to, to look at the kind of breaches that you're seeing right now out there in, in the community. Many of them are still on paper, so we certainly have not converted all the way to, pay, to electronic. Um, and many of them are still from portable devices, which is really, really kind of fascinating because we know what the fix for that is. We know that encryption, um, you know, and certain other kinds of security protections are the way to make sure that it, when you, when it's inevitable, when someone loses their laptop, their their tablet, their phone. Um, if you don't have it encrypted, then um, you're going to be in trouble. Um, but that's still, I mean, I think there's still some educational uh, challenges that, you know, that confront us as we, as we go forward on that. Um, so, so back to HIPAA, it covers something called protected health information, which is basically individually identifiable information, really anything to have to do with your medical record, including, can include things like your name, 
different identifying numbers. It can include demographic information as well as the information about conditions and diagnoses and medications, et cetera. Um, it covers three classes of organizations. One is providers, which are basically your hospitals, your doctors, your nurses, your occupational therapists, those kind of people. It covers plans. And so by that we mean insurance plans, and then that can be um, either a government insurance plan, like CMS's Medicare is an insurance plan, and it is covered by HIPAA, or uh, it could be a private plan, like whatever insurance plan that you have, United Health, you know, Kaiser Permanente, whatever. So all those plans are covered. And it also covers a third category of, uh, of entities that are a lot less uh, known. Those are called healthcare clearing houses. And healthcare clearing houses are um, sort of middlemen in the information world. So they can take um, standard information and reformat it for other purposes. So they could take an invoice and maybe turn it into an insurance claim. So they're used a lot in the middle for, um, for these purposes. And, and Congress realized that they were going to be handling a lot, a lot, of, um, a lot of personal information. So they um, are regulated as well. Collectively, we call these three kinds of entities covered entities, and you'll hear that term, covered entities, under HIPAA. Um, and, and how uh, information is regulated under HIPAA, HIPAA is basically what we call a disclosure law, which means that the law, wh what it does is tells entities, covered entities, um, under what circumstances are they permitted to disclose per PHI, per protected health information, to other entities. And anything that is not permitted, um, if it's expressly permitted, you can do the, the sharing without consent. Um, but if it's not expressly permitted, then you need to get the, the individual's consent to do any, any more sharing of that. Um, there's only actually uh, two required disclosures of a covered entity, and that's either to the secretary of HHS, subsequent, you know, pursuant to a um, you know, investigation or some kind of other oversight action and to the individual yourself. And so that's an important thing to remember. We'll talk about what your rights are under HIPAA, um, but the a covered entity is required to give you that information if you, if you ask for it under HIPAA. All other kinds of disclosures are discretionary, which places a lot of, um, shall we say, importance on the judgment of the covered entity whether they want to, want to disclose information or not. So it, it, just because a request is made to your provider for certain kind of information, they're not required to um, provide the information. So if they think something's not right here, they, it's okay for them to withhold it. Um, but there is a lot of sharing that is permitted under HIPAA um, without individual consent. And that includes um, anything for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, which I, you know, that's all to support the, the, the healthcare, um, you know, machine, and that, that makes sense. But there's also um, probably more than half a dozen other kinds of instances in which information can be disclosed. And most of these won't be surprising to you. It's for law enforcement, it's pursuant to a court order, it's for public health, it's for research, it's for, um, you know, if there's some kind of imminent threat to health and safety, then the information can be disclosed. But there's actually a fair amount of room where information can be disclosed without um, consent. And of course, you know, covered entities can always ask for your consent if they want to d disclose something in another, another situation. Um, d the other kind of entity that um, HIPAA talks about is something called a business associate. And es essentially what a business associate is someone who is essentially a, maybe a contractor to a covered entity, and they're doing something for the covered entity on behalf of the covered entity that requires them to use personal information. And in the past, um, the way these contractors were handled, it was um, the covered entity had to enter into a contract, and the contract had to have certain elements in it about how the information would be handled and you know, couldn't allow the business associate to use it in ways that the covered entity couldn't and this sort of thing. But when high tech was passed, they decided to make this, um, to, they were concerned that 
just having the contractual mechanism was not really enough to control this, the kind of personal information that these business associates had. So now these business associates are directly liable for following the privacy rule and the security rule, and they can be subject to enforcement actions as well. I don't know as we've seen that yet, but I think it's something that we're going to be seeing in the near, in near future. Okay. Um, I'm just going to try to go over some, some of these issues and, and what's happening out in the healthcare community. I'm going to start with consent. And, and we just talked a lot about consent, what requires consent in HIPAA, what, what doesn't. Um, when, when I uh, did my book last year, uh, one of the authors was a very, very interesting woman. Her name is Deborah Peel, and she is a practicing psychiatrist. She's from Texas. And she founded an organization called um, Patient Privacy Rights, PPR. And the reason that she, um, she established this organization um, was to advocate to get patients, pe well, she doesn't like me to call them patients, uh, people, more control over their health information because she thinks that there's been too much emphasis placed on the technology needed to exchange the information and, and do all these a analytical things, but not enough on giving people a technological way to be able to have more control over their information. She is very passionate about this. If you ever get a chance to, to, um, to hear her speak, she is, she is extremely enter entertaining. And it's true that when the, when, the, when the privacy rule was first issued during the end of the Clinton administration, it actually had a, um, a provision in there that even for treatment, payment, and that kind of thing, you had to get the individual's consent for that. Um, during the subsequent uh, administration that was quickly overturned, um, the new privacy rule was issued, uh, and uh, they said that would just, you know, st they were concerned that it was going to stop the healthcare um, system from functioning if you had to rely on someone to give permission every time it moved from, you know, one place to another, um, you know, even in maybe in, even inside of an entity. So um, uh, I think Dr. Peel would like to return to those days, uh, but uh, she she does make a passionate case for people to have more control over their information. And um, about a year ago, I saw a, a very interesting um, ABC News report, and actually Deborah was one of the people that they interviewed uh, about this situation. But there was a woman um, who went to an unnamed uh, uh, big, big health system. And she was treated there. She um, had been diagnosed with a bipolar disorder. She um, saw a psychiatrist in this um, very, very large practice. Uh, after some time passed, she asked for access to her records. I don't know why, but she did. And she found out somehow through this process that every provider in this entire hospital system, which was 6,000 providers, uh, nine hospitals, all of them had access to her detailed psychiatric information. She was, um, you know, devastated by this because she said, you know, I am speaking about my most innermost, you know, thoughts with my psychiatrist, and now I know that anybody in the system could possibly read it. She was, she was devastated. Um, you know, ABC News did go to the, to the hospital and said, you know, basically, what's up with that? And, and they said, well, it, in my view, they were basically unapologetic. Uh, and they said that um, uh, that they didn't want to withhold from any provider in their system important clinical information that what what might you see that you might see in a, in, in a mental health record. And they felt that you needed to make it available to all the physicians in the hospital. And they also said they, they recognized that there was a stigma, and there is a stigma attached to um, you know to people who seek treatment for, for mental health disorders, but they felt the stigma was actually reinforced by sequestering this information from, from being shared. So um, the bottom line of it is that the individual um, eventually um, decided to discontinue treatment. And this is one of the points that Deborah makes is that, you know, if people don't feel that their information is being treated, uh, you know, being kept private and secure, that they will either, they will withhold information from, from their physicians, information that the physicians need to know, and also um, that they will stop seeking treatment. 
And, and the patient under, it was really interesting in this article because the, the patient understood that there were certain things that were a safety issue. For example, there are certain kinds of medications that people may typically take for mental health conditions. If you are taken to an emergency room and your heart stops, there are some kind of medications they could give you which would um, actually kill you if you're on certain other medications. There would be an adverse interaction. So it's definitely a safety issue. But the patient said, you know what, you can share my medication list. I just don't want you to share everything I said with my psychiatrist. But you can see, I mean, I think this is, um, you know, I mean, if I were advising that hospital, I would say, you know, there are ways to do roles-based, um, you know, access in, in, um, in information systems. And certainly, I think there wasn't much of a justification to say that, I mean, every, uh, every um, provider in that hospital was not treating this woman. That's just beyond, you know, that's just beyond belief. And so there are ways that I think they could have um, uh, narrowed the scope of the access to, the, to this information. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, if you go back to my diagram and I was talking about how there are just so many players involved and there's a lot of new kinds of players emerging. For example, um, we have, if you've heard of health information exchanges, many states have health information exchanges and I'm not talking about the the insurance exchanges. I'm talking about organizations that act as a hub or as sort of a traffic cop to route information between different participating organizations that are in the healthcare community. And um, you also have all kinds of new vendors. You have, you know, electronic health records. You have a lot of data intermediaries that do, you know, various things to help reformat data and, and push them from one place to another. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues that has really come up is that um, most of these um, new entities are not, they're not covered entities under HIPAA. And actually it's interesting for most people to note that not all providers are actually covered under HIPAA either. You have to be uh, doing something uh, in electronic format. So if you, do, if you don't take insurance and you don't do things electronically, you wouldn't be covered by HIPAA. Now, admittedly, that's a small percentage of providers, but there are some who are outside the, the bounds of HIPAA as well. But uh, one of the concerns that has risen uh, recently is about these business associates, for example, um, electronic health record vendors. Um, as I said, the covered entity, if they're going to disclose information to the business associate, they're supposed to have a contract and they're supposed to, you know, agree on how the information is going to be, be treated. But what we're seeing is that some of these business associates are actually really large, um, you know, pretty powerful organizations. And there is actually, in some cases, less choice for providers than you might think for some of the services that are out there. And so some of these big business associates actually have a lot of market power. And as a result of this market power, they are often writing into these business associated contracts that they get rights to the data that is being put in the electronic health record. I mean, and this is obviously a, an incredible concern from a privacy perspective because, um, you know, this is so far removed from the patient, for example. The patient has no way of knowing that this is even happening or that their information could be used. Now, the, the EHR vendor cannot sell, you know, it's, it's now, you know, prohibited under HIPAA. They can't sell your information in identifiable form. But they can create de-identified information and they can, um, you know, they can sell that or use it for, for other purposes. And you obviously have no, no say in that. Um, obviously there's, you know, I think there's an educational challenge there um, to know, especially like small providers, that they understand what they're signing up for when they sign up for these services. We, we even found during some research we found one vendor, some of you may be familiar with an EHR vendor, that actually gives away the EHR vendor, they give away their product, which is an EHR, electronic record system. And, um, but what they are getting is that they are getting the information and the information itself is actually more valuable. So that's a very interesting, it's a web-based kind of um, uh, EHR. So more things happening. Um, I also, uh, 
talk a little bit about de-identified data since we're sort of on that topic now. Uh, under HIPAA, um, one of the things um, you know, that they wanted to assure is that researchers continued, could continue to use information because that's how we, we, we learn about you know, what procedures work, which don't. You know, we do all kinds of research with that, with that information. And, and HIPAA basically says if you de-identify information according to, it gives you two different ways to do that. You can either remove some identifiers or you can have an opinion from a qualified statistical expert. Um, and then it's de-identified and then it is outside the law. So it's no longer controlled in any way. It can be freely traded, it can be sold, it can be posted on the internet. Now, it's not always posted on the internet, and, and the reason why is that we now understand that de-identification is not an absolute either. It's, um, it's like a lot of things. Um, the de-identification can be broken under certain, certain circumstances, and there's always a re-identification risk associated with de-identified information. So, and if you, I don't know if anybody's familiar with um, Professor Latanya Sweeney, who's from Harvard University, formerly of uh, Carnegie Mellon, and she has, you can look up her work on the, on the internet, she has demonstrated, uh, you know, many times over how information can be re-identified from de-identified data sets. Now, and the reason that, that this is happening now is because of the wide availability of all kinds of public data sets out there. This would not be possible without these other data sets against which to um, which to compare and use. Um, this sort of leads us um, uh, to uh, an, another one of the, the chapters in my book, which has to do with um, genomics. And this chapter was written by two gentlemen who are both um, physicians, both very IT savvy, and they wrote about um, the, the use of genomics and genomic sequencing. And, uh, you know, and their, their names are Larry Ozeron and John Madison. And what they observed, if I can just boil it down to a few points, is that they're saying the value of genetic information is very valuable. It's very valuable to both the patient and their care and very valuable to the, to the physician. They're seeing that there is a decreasing cost associated with genomic sequencing. And so it, it may at some point make this actually affordable to be done for every patient at some point in time. This, um, and, and they even you know, sort of hypothesized that maybe it would even become a required part of, of people's care is to have this um, genetic information. And they saw it very much as bound to the um, electronic medical record in the future. But they also cautioned that they said that, you know, a genomic uh, information is uh, inherently identifiable. And we've actually known this for some time because um, if you go back to 2005, I don't know if anybody, any of you remember an article in the Washington Post about a young man, his name was Ryan Kramer, and he was um, conceived um, with a sperm donor and his mom. And when he got to be 14, he was very, as m most kids might be, he was very curious about his, about his biological father. And um, believe me, Ryan Kramer was no you know, regular 14-year-old kid, not any of the ones that lived in my house or sat around my table, because he decided to um, get his own genome he got his own genetic information um, mapped. He was able to compare it to some genealogical databases where people anonymously put up uh, their information. And he was with a little, he had to have a little information because there was a little information available from his, his mother. And he was able to narrow it down within, it took him a while, uh, to, two, to two different men. And he took a guess and he hit on the gentleman who was his biological father. So um, this kid is incredible. I'd like to know what he's doing now. He, um, at 14, he went to college at the University of Colorado. He then got a master's degree, and by 20, he was literally a rocket scientist at NASA. So I mean, this is not something I can do, and we can't do this at home, but I mean, it does show that there, um, you know, there's re-identification risk with this sort of thing. Um, there was also, you know, more recently, there was a big article in Science last year where uh, some researchers determined that knowing some information about surnames and having inform genetic information that they were able to do some re-identification of individuals in a publicly available database. Um, and the holders of the database at the time said, oh, it didn't 
we didn't know that someone would actually try to do that. So, um, you know, it's, and I, I'd say, I'd like to say the debate is, is raging on this, but um, I, I think the debate is just getting going because it's a very complex one. Um, and again, there's a lot of societal benefit to having um, this genetic information. It could do a lot to identify you know, early detection of diseases, you know, what have you. Um, but um, at the same token, I think we have to be protective of it. One thing I've noticed, though, about because we, you know, I work at MITRE and um, we actually do quite a bit of research. And one of the things I have noticed um, is that many organizations, even though they have de-identified data sets, they are becoming quite careful about how they share those, and they often put. Um, some kind of obligation on the part, even if you know if you have to buy it, they put some obligation on the part of the individual who buys it or the company who buys it to make sure that they protect it and that they don't disclose it f further, and that they don't, and they have to, you have to tell them what what you're doing with it and why, and and so they're very, they're quite careful about it, even though the law, you know, doesn't really require them to do this, but they see that there's uh, there's a need, so that's something that I think is going to be, you know, sort of, um, you know, bubbling up in in the future, I would say. The, um, the last sort of um, issue kind of thing that I, I'll talk about, and this is just because it's been um, something that um, I've been uh, following lately, and that has to do with um, individual rights. And I said people have, an, um, you know, people have a right under the law to go find out what information does your provider have about you. Um, you know, and one of the other rights is that you have a right to something called an accounting of disclosure, which means you can go to your doctor and you can say, okay, over the last six years, who have you shared this information with? And we're not talking about people inside the organization, but we're talking about who else have you shared this with? And you're, you're able to get this accounting. Um, there's been um, you know, a lot of debate about this uh, accounting for disclosures uh, you know, provision. And high tech actually asked um, you know, HHS to go back and look at this again and try to make it more useful. And they did come up with a proposal. Um, that was actually very detailed, and they said, well, we're going to pare back the time frame for the accounting disclosures, but we're also going to, you know, and this was proposed, they said, we're going to require uh, providers to, uh, of all types, all sizes, uh, to, to tell an individual, um, give them an access report that says who within the organization has accessed your information. And at the time, I think they thought that this could be done through security logs and that kind of thing. On further, you know, on further reflection, as this was proposed and a lot of public comment was received on it, I, I think the bottom line was is that um, many thought that, you know, it was it was well intended, but probably wouldn't work. The kinds of things that you would get from an access report would not be very user friendly and might actually just introduce more questions than answers. Um, so I think there's been some proposals that maybe people, if you, you know, saying instead that you're still entitled to accounting and disclosures, but if you're concerned about who's looked at your medical record, you could go to your provider and you could say, you know, I'm kind of concerned that maybe my neighbor who works here looked at it and they could do an investigation and they, they could give you the answer to to that question, and there's some feeling that perhaps that would be would be more useful than dumping something that could literally be pages and pages of information. So I mean, again, very difficult balance to to maintain here. You know, people do have a right to know what's going on for their information, but it has to be able to be produced in some kind of reasonable way, and it has to be, you know, frankly, has to be user user friendly. Okay. And sort of lastly. Um, Oops, you, did you go too far? Yeah, okay. Um, just some um, advice for, for you. Um, it's important for us to um, you know, protect our privacy as well. I always think of my father-in-law and every time you know, how they have the bonus cards at CVS and they have the bonus cards at Giant and he's like an old school guy and he would go in and say, well, can I get this if I don't give you my name? And they go, well, no, you have to give me your name. And so he would put us, you know, <laughs> He would put down a pseudonym. So he was, he's very funny about that. He wanted that discount, but he wasn't going to give them their, their name. Very stubborn about it. Um, but, but first of all, I mean, I think it's important for people to be educated about their, their rights um, under the law, not only in health care, but in other laws in terms of, you know, the information that you give to the government. Um, it's very important. 
Um, HHS, I have a, a, a link here at the bottom, they have actually quite an excellent site that talks about your rights under HIPAA and tells people um, what your rights are. And I, I would urge people too to exercise those rights. Now, when you go into a doctor's office, there's supposed to be, you know, the Notice of Privacy Practices, the NPP. And um, it's supposed to be posted, and you probably have to sign something that says, I've looked at it. And a lot of people think they're actually giving consent, but you're not. You're just saying, oh, I saw your notice of privacy principles. That's practices. That's, that's all that's really happening there. So, um, but I would urge you to at least scan it. It's not exciting reading. But if you have questions about how they're handling your healthcare information, I think it's important for you to ask. I think it's important for you to, um, you know, if you have, if you, if you're concerned about what's happening with your information, you should ask for access to it. Um, you should ask who's been looking at it. If they have a patient portal, you should look at that patient portal. You should see what kind of information is is maintained in that. I think it's important to be proactive. Um, there's a lot of uh, the rest of these really have to do with things outside, sort of the realm of, of HIPAA and your, your provider. But there are uh, lots of things on the internet. There's lots of apps. There's lots of personal health records where you can input some pretty, um, you know, if you choose to, some pretty, um, you know, personal information. You, you need to take steps to protect that. You need to, um, you know, it's as simple as or as complex as having good passwords. I mean, it's it's really important to do that. Um, it's important with social networking sites. I don't know. Um, I understand and I have heard that, you know, even physicians are starting to do, you know, use social networking sites for certain aspects of their practice. It scares me a little bit, but, you know, maybe that's the wave of the future. But think before you post. It's going to be up there a long time if you put it up there. Um, mobile devices. Um, when I talk about business associates who want to give themselves rights to your information, to, to patient information, it's the same thing with these medical apps, and they're becoming incredibly, incredibly popular. But read what the terms of use are and make sure that you're comfortable with how, that, how your information may be used. Um, you should think about encryption even for your personal devices. Um, you know, it's traveling, it's, it's vulnerable. Um, you might consider some kind of way to um, also remotely, you know, wipe or lock your um, your your device, your tablet, or your um, or your uh, smartphone. You can, and, and finally, um, you know, as a last resort, you can file a complaint. You can file a complaint with HHS's Office of Civil Rights, uh, the state's attorney general. And if it's something that's outside of HIPAA, then the FTC is also supposed to um, protect your rights. Um, if you have a complaint, if you think that a company has basically acted in violation of their own stated privacy principles, you can, you can complain to the FTC. And so that is the advice that I, I have, have for you. I would be happy um, to entertain questions about health information privacy or um, about anything else about privacy. I might not know all the answers, but I'm happy to talk about it. Do you have questions? Come to the side. You can hold it. Oh, okay. Um, well, I was just looking at your encryption. I mean, so that's our that's for us. Right. I understand that. But what are, what are the providers doing with mm -hmm. respect to encryption? Are they encrypting? Well, I think we can probably just talk. Yeah. yeah. I can probably hear you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so what are uh, when we hear about? Well, you used the example of the psychiatric uh, mm -hmm. notes being made available to the providers in the large mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, is that still a problem, or is that fixed? I mean, is there some rules that say that that information needs to be encrypted? So that I, I, I hear stories about mm -hmm. some folks who lose a laptop and twenty-seven thousand social security numbers and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. is there rules now as a result of that that have mm -hmm. been put into effect to encrypt that data to make it, you know, to protect it so that uh, you know it's not divulged? Erroneously. That's a great question. And yes, there are lots of rules, like in the security rule, about protecting information at rest, both when it's stored and both when it's transmitted. What they have, what has been found though that is kind of concerning is that as um, HHS has done some audits of, of various organizations to see how well they comply, is that the um, you know, I used to be an auditor. I guess I wasn't surprised by this, but the compliance is uneven. Um, and you still, 
and I mean, and if you look at the breach reports, you can you you can tell because the reason that you have a breach when you lost the laptop was because you didn't encrypt it. Had it been encrypted, it wouldn't be a breach. Nobody would be worried about it. So yes, there are rules. I think we have um, a ways to go to educate um, all the different levels of um, you know covered entities and providers uh, to make sure that this uh, this stuff is done well. Because you have to remember too is that HIPAA HIPAA applies to HIPAA applies to uh, you know this to the medical practice that I go to that has one one guy and one doctor and and, and one assistant. Um, it applies to them as, as as well as it does to huge medical systems that have a lot more expertise and resources to comply with this. So more you know more needs to be done, obviously. And the other question that you mm -hmm. the part about the uh, the notes being made available to the other mm -hmm. pra practitioners of Bellard's practice is that fixed or is that still an issue? I believe it's still an issue. I think that um, my understanding is is that it was n not uh, it was technically inside the law. I would say it would not be what I would advise anyone to do, and nor is it a best practice. It doesn't really make any sense. But I don't I don't know as it actually screwed the law. I think that was um, again uh, opportunity for for more education. Um, although uh, you know the the hospital did not do it in that case. They apparently did not do it unknowingly. They had a, a certain philosophy that they were tr trying to follow in doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I have a first a comment about the health information exchange in Virginia and mm -hmm. well connect Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I thought people should be aware that my understanding that it is an opt out system. Okay. Um, which I think that could be debated whether it should be opt out or opt in, but Yeah. Also, we argue about that when we get together with our privacy <laughs> friends. Should it be opt in or opt out? Yes. And and I have to say I don't have any specific knowledge about the um, about the Vir Virginia HIE really, but um, obviously the way we should be proceeding with health information exchange is to uh, you know not have everything available to everybody just because it can be. And there are ways with the technology to just make it available. Plus, uh, you know the. I believe that HHS is actually working very hard and with its advisory committees about how, what the rules of the road are going to be in terms of exchange. Um, I've worked quite a bit with the privacy and security tiger team that, uh, that advises HHS on, on, on privacy issues. And one of the issues they took up was the whole idea of under what circumstances if one, one physician queries another one and says, you know, I need information on X, what, what is going to be the rules of the road in terms of exchanging that information? So um, I wouldn't expect to see the example of the um, psychiatric notes to be replicated wi wi widely. So um, it will be more constrained than that, I'm sure. Uh, I just had a question about uh -huh. uh, the, uh, the insurers. I have, I'm under uh, a, a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay. And two things that I've noticed on it. First of all, is after I go to the doctor, I get a survey of what mm -hmm. the doctor's treatment was. Mm -hmm. In my personal opinion, that's none of their business what I talked to with my doctor about. Mm -hmm. I kind of told them that. Uh, and what did so they say? Well, they just, if you don't want to answer the question, mm -hmm. they, they have to. Right? Okay. <laughs> now, maybe they're surveying in terms of whether the doctor was, you know, didn't yeah. take but yeah. that seems to be a little bit over, mm -hmm. over the line. The second thing is, their security system is not particular, it's just a password, a name and a password, and it's not a particularly heavy password. Uh, but you can get your, you can't get your treatment records, but you can get your billing records. Okay. And if I know the name of the doctor and the procedure mm -hmm. that, that he was charging for, whether he's a gastroenterologist mm -hmm. or, I can tell you what that person's policy mm -hmm. is. Yep. Now, that does not seem to be particularly well protected. Okay. I just wanted to know whether you had any thoughts on that. 
Well, again, I mean, the issue of how to, and, and you're talking about, are you talking about the passwords you create, right? Right. Right. So, I mean, part, part of this is, 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 is on the, this is where the pressure is on the citizen to safeguard their, their information, just as, the, just as when, um, for example, if you go to your patient portal and you download information, well, then it's yours. You have to protect it yourself, and you should protect it from, you know, any kind of, un, you know, you, from anybody you don't want to see it. Um, but the whole issue of how to authenticate to uh, these systems has been a debate for some time. And there are certainly camps who say, um, you know, we would like stronger. We know passwords by themselves don't work terribly well. I don't think that's a secret to anybody. And so there are new things being worked on to allow. Um, and plus, people break down passwords because they forget them, and I forget everything. But you know, uh, so there are new things, including the national strategy for uh, trusted identities in cyberspace, where they're trying to come up with credentials that you can reuse, that are very secure, that can be used at lots of different, um, you know, both online, you know, consumer types of things, as well as for sensitive um, things like your, um, uh, like your patient portal. Um, but there's many places, you're right, that are not yet at that level. I have a question about mm -hmm. what can providers ask you information-wise? I've had some issues with some providers asking, oh, we need your social security number. Mm -hmm. We have to have the name of your employer, even though mm -hmm. my insurance is through my wife. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, my pediatrician for my son asked me if we own guns in our home. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. is this any of their business? And when I refused to answer those questions, yeah. it said, you don't need my social security number, you have my insurance card, you know, we guarantee payment, here's my credit card. Mm -hmm. It becomes very uncomfortable yes. in the office, and they spend more time asking questions and doing data entry mm -hmm. than they have to do examining you. Mm -hmm. <sighs> That's one of the big issues. So yep. is there any resource that says, you know, I don't have to provide you with this information even though you're asking it? Because they seem to be asking things that I thought Congress had said you don't have to give them your social security number. Right. But they insist on having it. Yes, they do. They do insist on having it. And I've, 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 I've had that same discussion, like, why do you need to know my husband's employer when I provide the insurance? I mean, what, what difference does it make? Um, and, and, and maybe the answer was right up here, like maybe you need to find another pediatrician that doesn't do that. Um, but I don't know of, um, and I think that's actually a great question, and now I'm going to go research it, because I don't know that there is anything that at that level says you can ask for this, but you can't ask for that. You know, um, so, uh, so I'm not aware of any constraints on that. Now, I know the question about firearms, though, I think is something that is um, pushed down from, actually pushed down from someplace in the federal government. And maybe probably somebody else knows about this more than I do, um, because I've heard a lot of people object to that. Um, because they're, say, they're portraying it as a public, um, as, a, as a safety issue, that if you had a firearm, I guess that you would be less safe. So, it's a great question. Pardon me? What would they do this, with this information? Is it harass you? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I only answer questions on a need to know basis ever. Mm -hmm. that do that. That's a good policy. <laughs> yes. I'd like to shift it a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking specifically about drones. Oh, okay. Yes. No, I didn't talk about drones. <laughs> no, I do know uh, uh, that the, uh, the 213 uh, session of the General Assembly in Virginia mm -hmm. established a commission to start taking a, a look at the, the drone issue, if you will, mm -hmm. given the sensors that, uh, that we have now that we're, we're using. Sorry, I can't go any further. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I see a certain threat to our personal privacy mm -hmm. from a less than, than uh, ethical uh, private investigator parking a drone mm -hmm. uh, over your house for six hours or 12 hours or mm -hmm. whatever, gathering what information the sensors are, are on, the, uh, on the bird. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I can't really comment, I mean, I'm not the expert on drones. I actually know people who are experts on drones. Uh, but I share your concern, um, of, you know, for the kinds of, um, you know, things that they might be, be capable of. Um, and I, I wasn't excited about Amazon drop using a drone to drop my package on my front lawn. I said, what about a small child or a dog or something, you know? So, no, I'm sorry, I don't know anything more about that except that I share your concern. Okay, great. One is I understand the FTC right now restricts any private individual from using drones and they could pop off of it. That would mm. eliminate your private investigator mm. for now. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, quite by accident, I found out that uh, there's an entire block of domain names <clears throat> starting with drone hunter, mm. drone killer, that have all been purchased <laughs> by several companies. Oh. Uh, so it looks like there's uh, certainly an underground market for eliminating drones if you want them. It looks like <laughs> <laughs> but to get to my actual question, oh. um, and I, I, want to, I guess I'm departing from the healthcare somewhat. Um, with the proliferation of you know, all these technological advances that mm -hmm. we have and the ability to, to pass information on and get information on other mm -hmm. people, I'm wondering if you would look a little bit into the future. and. See what you think about the uh, where we're headed in, in terms of privacy. I mean, if you look at the generations, most of the people here are probably much more concerned about their privacy mm -hmm. than people who are in their teens, twenties, mm -hmm. and so forth. And you know, I, I'll give you one little vignette that happened to uh, somebody I know: uh, married couple, one child, one of the spouses died. The other spouse had a Facebook page with eight friends on it. Lonely one night posted a few whiny little blogs, mm -hmm. put their child to bed. Two hours later, the police knocked on the door, took them to the, and, and voluntarily committed them to the uh, you know, mental ward of the local hospital, put the child with a relative, uh, because some one of those eight people had printed those little whiny emails out and said, oh my God, I think they're a danger to their child and themselves, and you've got to do something. Mm. And I, you know, you hear stories like this all mm -hmm. the time, but I think, you know, it's unlikely that somebody at our age would put any of that stuff up anyway. Mm -hmm. We're fairly suspicious of the internet, but you look mm -hmm. at the younger generation who think nothing of sexting and all kinds of other mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. without seeing the attendant consequences. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if maybe you'd look in the future a little bit and give your opinion of what, uh, what kind of trends you see. Well, if, you, if you're talking about trends sort of in public opinion, um, one of the things that I discovered when I was researching my book was that um, the, the generational issues that we perceive um, might not be as strong as what we think. And there's been a number of recent research um, research uh, evidence that suggests that actually young people are, are very concerned about their privacy. And so, um, and I think there's maybe been a, a little bit of assumption maybe around the idea that they're willing to share what they want to share pretty freely, right? And because they're using the social networks, that Facebook, the whatever. And, and frankly, everybody always asks me, are you on Facebook? And I am on Facebook, but I use it very, very sparingly and I was sort of forced there kicking and screaming. Um, because it concerns me. Um, but I think there still is going to be, um, their concerns might be a little bit different, um, but I think that the generations behind us are going to be concerned about privacy as well. I think we're going to be concerned about uh, our ability, because our ability to collect information and then our associated abilities to analyze that information are becoming so great that um, just like Dr. Weston said in his book, I mean, these technologies weren't developed, you know, necessarily for surveillance, but it was once you had the data and once you had the technology that there started to be these different uses of both the technology and the, um, and the information. Um, so, uh, I mean, I guess what I'd like to see in, in the future is that just because we have the technology doesn't mean we should use it. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. And what I would like to see is that, especially in the case of government, that there be a greater um, burden on the, on the government to show um, efficacy. Because privacy aside is that when you're talking about some of these programs that are really privacy invasive, 
I think that the, the burden on, on the government, especially given the, the powers of the government, is that they should be able to show that, um, that this is something that is, is appropriately balanced with the kind of um, privacy um, you know, invasiveness that's attached to it. Um, so that's what I'd like to see. I think privacy isn't dead. I mean, its death has been, you know, prematurely announced many, many times. But I, I think that the issues are going to accelerate and increase over time, and it's going to be important for um, uh, for, for all of us not to be complacent about this, but um, you know, to to voice our concerns about it. Thanks, Chris. The. Uh information that you've been talking about with medical seems to be pretty much a, a quid pro quo. I want medical service, mm -hmm. so in return I need to fill out this, that, or whatever mm -hmm. else, or you, the provider, can maintain right. records, which is understandable right. yep. to a degree. Once a person decides that they no longer need the services of the physician or the health group or whatever, is there any provision that shuts down the further distribution, the further uh, use of my information. From, if, if you quit going to the doctor. Right. I don't, um, that is a great question. I, I don't know of any, and in fact there are, you know, rules around that they're supposed to maintain it a certain amount of time. I don't think we've gotten to the point where I know exactly, where I think we know yet how that information will be, will be, will be treated in the future. But that is a great question. I'll have to look at that one too. You guys are like hard, <laughs> difficult. Yeah, I th thank you for your, your lecture and uh, you a lot of good information. Uh, I know you, you, you advise HHS. Where are they on securing their website? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry to throw that one out to you. I don't, I, yeah. you know what, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't I mean, know. They're great writing all the regulations, but <laughs> enforcing them and, and now bringing the IRS into mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah, I can see you're going to be busy for a few years. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. So there's, yeah, that's my big, I, I mean, would you go on there and put all your stuff on that website? On um, which website? Are we talking the, about the exchanges? Your, your, your healthcare.gov. Well, I, I think I'm just going to duck the question because <laughs> I, do, I don't have to. I know you don't have to. I don't have to, to so I won't. Yet, but okay. That's kind of scary. Yeah, I okay. just wondered how they were progressing on their, uh, yeah. their and side I, of security. That's not my, my area, so I really can't. I shouldn't comment. Okay. okay. I did have one more question. Sure. Early on in your presentation, mm -hmm. you talked about the value of it. Yes. Well, you said the medical was worth fifty dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know, or if you know, mm -hmm. who would buy that, and what would they do with it? Uh, well, criminals, <laughs> because they would be breaking the law, and to uh, do things like um, insurance fraud, and 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 that sort of thing would be the, the primary reason for, for stealing your medical records. I mean, I suppose in some scenarios you could imagine that somebody could steal it and then use it to blackmail you, but that doesn't sound like a very you know, efficient way to even be a criminal, right? So, so medical fraud. And also, I'm sorry, medical identity theft. I'm sorry, I did, almost didn't say that one. Um, because that is, a, according to many of the studies, that is a growing concern. Um, I think what we've seen so far is a lot of times it is a family member who is close who steals the medical identity, but that is still a concern and that's rising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I always think of uh, Ronald Reagan and his jelly beans as being kind of a, just kind of shows his humanity and the, um, it always just makes me smile. So I have oh. a jar of Reagan's jelly beans for you. Oh, thank you so desk. much. Thank you. That's lovely. And a lovely gift box from the Reagan oh. Library to go, go with that. Thank but, you. Uh, thank you so much for that.